then it went away again. It's up now. Okay, very good. Okay, so uh, apologies everyone for the uh, delay. There was a long delay there. My computer crashed and uh, yeah. Okay, so we, we earlier we, we, we had the, uh, the privilege of listening to Jack Marshall talking about the use of force by several states uh, even during the, the present times. And we would have thought that after World War II and World War I, the Vietnam War and um, the Korean War in the 1960s, as well as the Balkan Wars in the 1990s, we would have thought that you know, states wouldn't have to use that law, the use of force, but that goes on today. And what we need to remember, however, is that it is pertinent to talk about uh, the use of force in international law for several reasons. One is the use of force, essentially, both in terms of the threat of force and the actual use of force. Uh, okay, give me a second. I'm, I'm able to share the PowerPoint slides now. We're back. Okay, very good. Fantastic. Whew. My goodness, the technology. Okay, so you're able to see the PowerPoint slides there? Fantastic. Okay, so uh, it is important to talk about the law of the use of force, mainly because the threat of the use of force and or the use of force itself uh, has the potential to actually undermine the sovereignty of a state or the political independence of a state. And we need to remember that when we talk about one of the essential attributes of a state and one of, one of the rights, the important rights of a state, one is the right to territorial integrity and the right to sovereignty. So therefore, when you have a state, and it could be Russia, it could be the United States, and I'm talking of the major players, you know, the, the big, the more powerful states uh, in, the, in this manner, because they're usually the ones able to wield the, the stick. There is the likelihood that by threatening another state with the use of force or even using force itself there's always the likelihood that you know that that will impair the uh, the territorial integrity or the sovereignty of a state imagine for example not imagine but consider for example what's happening in ukraine and you know if, if you're very familiar with, with what's happening in ukraine ukraine is attempting to join for example the north alliance treaty organization the nato the, the problem, however, is that there seems to have been a threat on the part of the, the, the state of, of Russia that if Ukraine were to join NATO, it will invade NATO. I mean, sorry, it will invade Ukraine. And so the idea about states, for example, joining NATO, and so therefore become, they become kind of Western-centric, and brings with it the potential of a reaction from some other states. And we need to wonder, therefore, the idea of threatening another state, that would already undermine, if you notice, the ability of a state to determine for itself, you know, how to, uh, how to undertake and decide upon its own, uh, you know, international relations. At the same time, the other thing we need to consider is that what actually happens when there is a state that has threatened the use of force or has used force, okay, and we will, we will explain what force means in a short while. Is there a, a power on the part of another state that has been threatened or against, against whom force has been used? Would that other state have the right to strike back? Would that state have the right to self-defense, for example? And when you speak of another state using the principle of self-defense in order to retaliate, to hit back, is there a necessity for you know, armed force to actually have been used? Or is it sufficient that force has been used in whatever ways? And at what point can it be said that it is permissible for another state to actually undertake a preemptive strike? Because we recall uh, during the height of the Cold War, for those who, of us who were you know, already a bit of mature during that time, there was always the idea of the, of the MAD, the mutual assured destruction uh, between the United States and Russia in, in the 1980s. And it's happening even now, that when you, when you consider about the possibility that one state is about to you know, strike your state with nuclear weapons, you don't have a choice but to do a preemptive strike. 
And that raises the question, would a preemptive strike actually be permitted in international law? When you think about that, is that permissible in international law? Because if, if you delay striking back at, at an enemy state that is likely to annihilate a sizable part of your population, not even a sizable part, but you know, a small part of your population, surely, I mean, you wonder, uh, would a state whose population could potentially be threatened by nuclear weapons have a right to do a preemptive strike? We also have another problem about um, some states harboring uh, terrorist organizations. So we see this happening in, in Iran. We see this happening in Syria. We see this happening in, in Lebanon. We see this happening in Pakistan because we remember that um, Osama bin Laden was actually cuddled by the Pakistani ISI. And so, you know, Osama bin Laden was there. And if a state, therefore, becomes a, how do you call it? If, if a state cuddles a terrorist organization, and the terrorist organization then uses that state as a springboard to attack another, to, to attack a state, using, you know, as, using uh, armed forces, for, armed force, for example, would that mean that the other state now has a right, as a matter of self-defense, to strike back against the terrorist organization, even if it means, you know, invading the, uh, the, the other state and perhaps impairing, therefore, the territorial integrity of another state. So these are, I think, relevant questions uh, in international law. So tonight, after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain the rules of international law on the use of force. And when we speak of the use of force, for example, uh, do we make a distinction between force as in armed force? Um, is there a difference between supplying, you know, um, an entity that would then wage war in your behalf, like Russia is supplying some, you know, some milit how do you call them, the, some paramilitary groups uh, within Ukraine, for example, to, to attack the, the, the Ukraine state? Does that constitute a breach of international law? And if Ukraine were powerful enough, would it actually have the power, the right, under international law, to hit back at Russia, assuming that were the case? Do we make a distinction between military force and economic force? Because today, uh, if you look at China, the use of economic force seems to be a more potent weapon than armed force. Wouldn't you agree? And and then you've got issues about. Um, is there a need for, uh, is there a distinction between armed force as opposed to an armed attack? Because you can be using armed force without actually, you know, using armed attacks, as we see later on in the Nicaragua case. So tonight, we're going to go through uh, seven discussion questions. We're also going to cover the, the quiz question tonight. If we have the time, we're going to go through the seven of them, but prepare seven questions. So let's begin with question one. But before we do that, would any of you have any question? Any question that you may want to raise? So we're good? Okay, very good. So let's begin by going through question one. Can I get a volunteer to read question one for us? Just to read the question. I'll do it, man, Jack. Thank you, Peter. After a series of border incidents with its neighbour over a piece of land adjoining the two states, Kandoma decided to teach Rutamu a bitter lesson. On January the 1st, 2014, the Kandoman president announced on, on the state television channel, the Kandoman Broadcasting Corporation, CBC, that he had decided to put a stop to the endless frictions along its borders, but he did not explain what he meant by that. Um, on the following day, thousands of forces from the Kandoman National Army moved to the border, shared with Rutmu, taking with them scores of armoured tanks, anti-aircraft guns and heavy artillery. Brigadier John Thapor, Director of Military Intelligence in Rutamu, and who was on a private visit to 
Kandoma happened upon an official memo in that country in which Colonel Ellen Diacrast, the military intelligence advisor to Kandoma, advised her government to ensure a total assault on the enemy. The memo did not mention Rutamu by name. As legal advisor to the Rutamuan Foreign Office, advise your president on what action to take under these circumstances. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Any ideas? Is there anything that could be done? So, what do you think? Report it to the UN Security Council for starters. Okay, very good. Yes. If you're strong enough, it could be considered to be uh, basically an act of war and then, therefore you could um, take initial action to ah. but it wouldn't be it wouldn't this that would not be um it seems to be the way that they go these days but that's not according to um article 51 of the un charter very good so maybe perhaps a more specific question will be whether or not um you could you could um suggest to the rutamu president that it could invoke the right to self-defense in order to attack kandoma so the basic question is, do you suppose, given the facts, that uh, Rutamu would be able to claim the right to self-defense in order to attack Kandoma? That is one of the questions. Yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. Because you've got, a, you've got a threat there, and there's obviously intelligence to say that, um, that their, rec their people are recommending an all-out assault. Mm. So that is is an imminent threat, and mm. um, they're they're ready to go. So yes, a preemptive strike against them would certainly be be as you know a self, an act of self defence as far as I was concerned. This does happen all the time, right? The idea of brinkmanship, military brinkmanship. So you've got even in in Ukraine right now. You do have the uh, what what the the Russian government would often say. You know, they're just redeploying troops, putting in their tanks, and so on near the Ukrainian border. And by doing that, assuming that Ukraine were armed, let's say by the United States or some of the Western states, and they had the capability of you know attacking uh, the Russian forces there, do you suppose that they could actually invoke the right to self-defense? in order to, to attack, you know, Russia, for example. So let's assume that not only, not o let's assume that Kandoma, Kandoma in this particular instance was very specific in threatening Rutamu that, you know, because of what they've done, they will invade Rutamu. Let's assume there is that clear, that clear threat. Okay. The question is, on the basis of a clear threat on the part of Kandoma to invade Rutomo, and in this particular case, Kandoma had already moved um, scores of armored tanks onto aircraft guns and heavy artillery uh, in the border shared with Rutomo. The question then is, you know, in that particular instance, would, can, would um, Rutomo then be able to invoke the right of self-defense in order to uh, launch a military strike against uh, Kandoman forces in the border? What do the others think? Let's think about that. Others, what do you think? So what we need to remember is that there is a difference between the use of force or the threat of the use of force and an armed attack. So it is very, International law right now is very conservative in relation to a, the, the, the idea of, an, of a right to self-defense. You can only invoke the right to self-defense if an armed attack has occurred. So the idea of a preemptive strike is not a principle that is accepted in inter international law. 
So under Article 51 of the United Nations Charter, which is a codification of international customary law, the right to self-defense can only be invoked by a state when an armed attack has occurred against it. So short of an armed attack, even when there has been the threat of force or the use of force, if the use of force is short of an armed attack, then that state cannot invoke Article 51 as to the right of self-defense. Let's be very specific about the distinction between armed attack and the use of force. Because you can speak of a use of force in the sense that uh, one state can actually use, uh, you know, can use uh, logistics for the purpose of aiding, uh, uh, aiding, you know, a, a certain armed force. But in that particular, they could they could even have um, entered a state, and in that particular case, they, they could they could be in a position to to arm you know certain paramilitary groups and so on. But for as long as you know these actions are short of an armed attack, you cannot invoke the the right to self defense because the, the requirement the strict requirement under international law is that there must be an armed attack for a state to be able to invoke the right to self-defense, okay? So in this particular case, if I were the legal advisor to the Rotomu One Foreign Office, under the facts, uh, it would be very difficult to, uh, for the, Rutomu, the state of Rutomu to invoke the right to self-defense in order to undertake a preemptive strike against Kandoma under the facts, even if Kandoma threatened an actual invasion in the particular, in, under the facts. Um, Kandoma hasn't even threatened to invade, but even if it didn't did, even if it, it did, even if Kandoma actually threatened uh, to invade Rutamu, because there has still been no armed attack, no armed attack has occurred, the right to self-defense cannot be invoked by Rutamu. Now the other question is, under the facts, Assume that the official memo provided direction that Kandoma was to undertake a total military assault on, on Rutomo. So can Rutomo launch a preemptive strike? The answer is no. But the other question we have here is, was there, could there be a breach of international law by the actions of Kandoma? So maybe that's the other question that we should be asking. Under the facts, could there be a breach of international law? by Kandoma, by its actions. Under the facts. So let me repeat the question. Under the facts, could Kandoma be in breach of international law by its actions? And if Kandoma is in breach of international law, what exactly would it be breaching? Would anyone wish to answer the question? So the answer is still no. There would be no violation of international law on the part of Kandoma because it hasn't used force yet against Rutamu. It hasn't threatened Rutamu either uh, with a use of force. So there still is no breach of international law. So until such time that Rutamo actually, uh, until such time that Kandoma actually threatens uh, Kandoma, such as threatening it with invasion, only then. So if Kandoma threatens Rutamo, that Kandoma would invade Rutamo, that would then uh, constitute a, a threat of the use of force that will be a violation of international law. Okay, under Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the, U of the United Nations Charter. But if... Uh, Kandoma does not threaten to invade uh, Rutamu, there will be no violation. It will be uh, within the sovereign right on the part of Kandoma to put its uh, armed forces close to the border with Rutamu. It's part of its uh, sovereign rights. Questions? So we have to be clear that there is no, the idea of a preemptive strike against Kandoma is not permitted under under international law because the principle of anticipatory self-defense uh, is not accepted in international law. There is no principle of anticipatory self-defense. 
in relation to uh, the relations between states. Uh, I, I made a clarification because there will be a distinction, as we see later on in one of the questions, pertaining to terrorist groups. Okay. Let's move on to question three, and this pertains to the quiz question. Can I get somebody to read question three for us? Just to read the question. I will, if you can hear me. Thank you, Heidi. Very good. Thank you, Heidi. Yes, please. Lunario has for some time been facing an armed rebellion from Lunarian freedom fighters, a local rebel group. Its ability to quash the rebellion has been impaired by continuing support from the LFF, has been receiving from Antuario, a neighboring state. In particular, Antuario has been providing money and weapons to the LFF after di diplomatic efforts of Lenario failed to stop Antuario's support for the LFF. And the Lenario has now considered taking Sorry, re Retali retaliatory action against Antuario itself. As Lenario's legal advisor, advise Lenario whether it can use armed force against Antuario. Which of the following statements is the most correct answer? Okay. So when the answers come up, can you continue reading? Uh, yeah. Thank you, Andy. Which of the following statements is the most correct answer? A, Lenario has the right to use armed force against Antuario ba based on its right to self-defense. B, Lenaro has no right to use armed force against Antuario based on its right to self-defense. C, because Antuario is merely providing money and weapons to the LFF and is not directly involved in itself in any armed conflict with Lenaro, Antuario is not in breach of any obligation under international law prohibiting the use of or threat of force against its territorial integrity or political independence of any state. D, the prohibition against the use of or threat of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state as stated in Article 2, Subsection 4 of the United Nations Charter applies only to states who are members of the United Nations. E, all the answers are wrong. Okay, thank you, Heidi. Now, so again, let me just clarify, note that the facts clearly say that Antuario has been providing money and weapons to the Lunarian Freedom Fighters. So that is the extent of the involvement of Antuario. So Lunar Antuario has been providing money and weapons to the LFF, okay? So given that scenario, can I just ever ask everyone to post his or her answer in the chat box from A to E? What do you suppose is the correct answer? And we know that during the quiz itself, these answers are shuffled. So, but for the moment, we are able to, to know what the potential answers are. So for the purpose of the tutorial, kindly indicate what, the, what you think is the correct answer. Mm. So a lot of the students have answered C. Go on, can I get the, the others? A from Jack. Very good, go on. So we've got 11 students. I'd like to see 11 answers if possible. Remember, this is just, you know, a, an exercise. So it's always, it's always good to get it right. It's also good to get it wrong because then if you know that you've made a mistake, then you're likely not to forget the mistake. So we'll see again from, 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 okay. So, okay, has, has everyone answered? Very good. Okay, so a majority of the class has actually answered C. Is that right? So I've got how many are answering A as well? One, two. So two have answered A, nine have answered C. So for nine students, the correct answer is C, because Antoine is merely providing money and weapons to the LFF and is not directly involved itself in any armed conflict with Lunario. Antuario is not in breach of an obligation under international law, prohibiting the use or threat of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. That is the overwhelming answer of nine students in this tutorial. Two, however, have said that Donario has the right to use armed force against Antuario based on its right to self-defense. 
everybody's wrong. Everybody's wrong. Okay, in relation, so this is, a, this is a, a crucial point, and we make a distinction, therefore, between the use of force and the use of armed force. In relation to C, uh, if we examine the, the Nicaragua case, which was the case of Nicaragua versus United States of America in 1986, and uh, you will recall the, the con, is that the contra affair? What had happened was that the United States had, uh, what was that well-known colonel? Uh, got the name now, because he testified in the U.S. Congress. At that time, what the United States had done, and which the United States continues to do today, is to actually, uh, you know, arm certain paramilitary groups in order to destabilize another government. That's, so that's what the United States did. It armed the, the contra forces that were trying to, to, um, to topple the government of the Sandinista government in Nicaragua at that time. And so, if that is the case, the question is, would the United States, or in the example we have, Antoine be in violation of international law? Following the case of Nicaragua versus United States of America in 1986, the International Court of Justice said that uh, the United States, and in this case, Antoine would be violating international law because it would breach, be breaching customary international obligations not to intervene in the affairs of another state. So these are, this is a similar example in the case of Nicaragua versus United States of America, where a state is arming paramilitary groups uh, in order to you know, uh, intervene in the affairs of another state. According to the International Court of Justice, in the case of Nicaragua versus United States of America, uh, that would constitute an intervention of an, of the, into the affairs of another state and would be a breach of interna customary international law obligations okay because that constitutes the use of force in the case of Nicaragua versus United States of America now if we know therefore that there is a breach of international obligations under international law so see it cannot be seen because there is a breach of an obligation under international law so if there has been a breach of obligation of international law by one state because that state used force against the territorial integrity of another state, the question that, ar that arises is, can that state whose territorial integrity has been impaired, can it invoke the right to self-defense? And the answer of two students was A, Lunario has the right to use armed force. The answer again is no. Under the circumstances, um, the ICJ was able to make a distinction between the use of force and the use of armed force, because we recall that under Article 51 of the United uh, Nations Charter, the right to self-defense can only be invoked if there is an armed attack. So the mere, the, the, and I'm not using the, the word, the use of the word mere is incorrect. So supplying arms to certain armed forces, in the, in the example we gave, the supplying money and weapons to the Lunarian Freedom Fighters, a local rebel group, would constitute uh, the use of force following the case of Nicaragua versus United States of America, but it would not mean that um, Antuario has then engaged in an armed attack against Lunario itself. So while Antuario will be in breach of its inter customer international law obligations, against uh, the use of force uh, that would then impair the territorial integrity or political independence of another state, such supply of money and weapons to a local, to the L LFF, would not constitute an armed attack against Lunario, and for that reason, Lunario cannot invoke the right to self-defense against Antuario. Okay? Now, the other answer we have is letter D. Would the prohibition against the use of force or threat of force against the ter territorial integrity or political independence of, an, of any state bind only those states or members of the United Nations? Because we see that it is a treaty provision, which is Article 2, 2 Paragraph 4 of the United Nations Charter. Does that particular international law based on a treaty obligation apply therefore only to states or members of the UN, 
and who therefore are parties to the United Nations Charter? Or does it apply to all states, even those who do not happen to be members of the United Nations? Because we recall, some states are not members of the UN. Couldn't that be the correct answer? As Ilyonka pointed out, the answer is D is wrong because Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the United Nations Charter is a codification of customary international law. So it binds all states. Not only is it a treaty provision, it is actually a codification of customary international law, which therefore binds all states. In fact, it is considered a peremptory norm of international law. No state is permitted, therefore, to enter into a treaty that would give it the right to, to invade another country. That would not be permissible because it is a peremptory norm of customary international law. Questions before we move on to question four. We're good? Okay. So the, the other question that were there was that under the same facts, determine whether Antwari's acts of providing money and weapons to the Lunarian freedom fighters would be a breach of international law. And we know the answer. The answer is yes. Following the case of Nicaragua versus United States of America in 1986, the act of providing money and weapons to the Lunarian freedom fighters would be a breach of international law pertaining to customary international law to re, for a state to respect the territorial integrity and political independence of another state. So question five, I'm just gonna read this. New Iceland sent a communique to the state of Finland that unless the latter took immediate steps to control money laundering in his territory, New Iceland would impose harsh financial and economic measures against it, including confiscating Finland state assets found in New Iceland. Advise the state of Iceland whether the threats of New Iceland are in breach of international law. From Tamara, no. Okay, what do the others think? From Emma, no. Ilyonka, no. Very good, go on. From Peter, no. So the answer is no. The threat of the use of economic force will not be a breach of international law because what international law prohibits is the threat of the use, the threat or use of armed force. So while it is not clearly stated uh, in Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the United Nations Charter that it is armed force that is impermissible. It is generally understood by most, most states and by most commentators that the, the, what is impermissible and prohibited is actually the threat or use of armed force. Okay. Now, Another, an interesting question, however, is this, okay. Um, let's assume that, in, again, in question five, what a state would do then is to threaten that um, it would seize, for example, the assets of another state that are in the territory of another state. If that other state refuses to cede a certain territory to the other state. So let's say New, New, New Iceland, uh, informs the state of Finland that unless the state of Finland uh, cedes and gives up certain territory to New Iceland, or unless, for example, the state of Finland releases certain um, prisoners of war, then New Iceland uh, will uh, seize certain uh, certain will, will seize certain uh, assets that belong to the state of Finland, which can be found in New Iceland. Okay, so it's not armed force, but it's still a threat of an economic, you know, of economic measures. The question is, would that be a breach of international law or would that be permitted? I don't think that it would be a breach of international law because um, at this stage, however, if they did go ahead and um, um, you know, because if they really want that property, they're going to go in there anyway, mm -hmm. and they're going to breach international law by attacking it. Mm -hmm. So, but I don't think the 
the threat of, of um, seizing assets would be a breach of international law. Okay, very good. What did the other state? Uh, I would I agree with Peter. I actually, but um, I think that until uh, depending on the asset, unless it's a pretty much uh, a military asset or a um, an embassy, it's property within it's the property of New Iceland, and they can pretty much do it's their sovereignty. Ah, okay, okay. Now, so in general, that that is correct. In general, it is correct to say that you know, the threat of uh, economic force, the use of economic force, or the threat of the use of economic force, in general, would not constitute a violation of international law, okay? But there are some commentators who advance the view that when the, th the threat or the use of economic force is used to coerce uh, certain states, it is possible that there might be a departure from the norms of international law, or even a breach of customary international law pertaining to the, the non-use of coercion uh, in relation to international relations between states. So there is a, a view that's, so there is a distinction when one state is threatening the use of economic force uh, for, let's say, for lawful reasons. But if the, if the, if the, if the, uh, if the purpose becomes to coerce and therefore potentially to impair the political independence of another state. There is a view, and so again, I'm saying that this, there is an argument, there is a view that there potentially can be a breach of international law which prohibits the use of coercion against states that might impair their political independence. Okay, so I'm just raising that because that was discussed by Abbas in his, in his textbook. If if this was the case, though, wouldn't you find that the U.S. would have a permanent, um, be permanently before the judges? <laughs> That's true, because it does uh, threaten economic sanctions. But again, we, we make a distinction in that case between, again, you know, the threat to use economic sanctions because for laudable reasons and or for moral reasons and those uh, where uh, the threat of economic sanctions is actually really to just coerce another state to act in a particular way. That, that actually is problematic in international law because, as you correctly pointed out, Peter, because there are those who, who say more of the view that if you allow moral considerations to come in, and therefore there become subjective uh, interpretations of whether an act is moral or not, there is no place in international law for those subjective uh, interpretations. So I, I'm just raising that because there is a view in international law that the threat of uh, use of economic force for the purpose of coercing another state, such as, you know, you're not, we're, we're, we're not gonna, we're gonna call on loans and so on, can potentially uh, impair the political independence of, of states and would violate, therefore, the customary obligation of, of states to, uh, to engage in friendly relations with one another. Okay, question six. Can I get somebody to read question six for us? Question six. I'll just read the question then. I'll, I'll read it if you like. Yeah, Peter, go ahead. go ahead, please. Al Qaeda, a terrorist organization, has been operating in the state of Kenya for several years. From the state of Kenya, Al Qaeda has occasionally engaged in armed attacks against the state of South Ireland. The state of South Ireland has repeatedly asked the state of Kenya to put a stop to the attacks by Al Qaeda without success. The state of South Ireland has finally decided to attack Al Qaeda within the borders of Kenya. Advise the state of South Ireland as to the legality of such actions in international law. Okay. So in this case, we have Al Qaeda, which is okay. Afghanistan all over. Uh huh. What do you think? I'll let it go. Um, yes, I would, have, I would have thought that, um, like, if the state of Kenya had sort of no idea that it was going on or there was no links, then there'd be um, 
uh, the state of South Ireland wouldn't have anything against them, but the fact that um, they've asked them to help stop the attacks by Al Qaeda and the state of Kenya essentially still allowing them to occur, well then the state of South Ireland does have something against them. I know that's not very technical, but anyway. Mm. The okay. case of self-defence, and um, they've breached Article 51 mm. um, by, um, as, as Tamara says, um, shielding the, the terrorist group and therefore it's, it's, it's basically what the Taliban did in, in, um, and that caused America to invade Afghanistan. Mm. The relevant question, however, is, is it actually possible to argue that because Al-Qaeda is operating in the state of Kenya, therefore Al-Qaeda is necessarily an agent of the state of Kenya? Are we able to argue that? Therefore, meaning the, the acts of Al-Qaeda by the mere fact alone that it is operating within the state of Kenya is necessarily the acts of the state of Kenya. Because for us to invoke Article 51 of the United Nations Charter concerning the right to self-defense, you have to make the argument that an armed attack has occurred. Are we therefore saying that Al-Qaeda, as an agent of the state of Kenya, has engaged in an armed attack? But what if the state of Kenya is unable to control Al-Qaeda? Do you make a distinction or not? No, the state the state isn't responsible for um, mm. the actions of Al Qaeda, un unless there's a clear like there becomes a clear link, a clear and tenable link that um, they've got the backing of that um, organization. That would be the correct. I think that would be the correct view, according to Jack, because it is a very dangerous proposition. Remember, there, there are so many states today, including the Philippines, which Jack cited earlier, where you have terrorist groups operating within, even in Indonesia not because they're necessarily agents of those states, but simply because those states are actually unable to control them. So it cannot therefore be said that the actions of terrorist groups within a particular state are necessarily the actions of the state or of the whole state. It can only be the actions of the whole state if you can see that the terrorist group is acting as an agent of the whole state. I think it would depend too, uh, this would depend upon the steps that were taken by mm. Kenya to, um, to, to try and stop them too, rather than, you wouldn't just go ahead. I mean, there'd have to be a, a nexus between the two groups, you know, between the government and the, the terrorist organisation. Yeah, that's right. Very good. Now, Clinton has uh, pointed out uh, a very important UN Security Council Resolution 1373. Earlier we said that uh, the idea of an anticipatory self-defense or preemptive strike against another state that has threatened to use armed force another state is not accepted in international law. So in the example I gave, uh, we gave earlier, if, one, if let's say state A threatens to invade state B, the mere threat of using armed force of, of, of state A invading state B will not justify a preemptive strike on the ground of the right, anticipatory right to self-defense. That is not permissible in international law. But in relation, however, it would appear, in relation to terrorist groups that operate within the territories of certain states, under UN Security Council 1373, which was cited by uh, Clinton, the UN Security Council has passed a resolution which, is, which says that states have a duty to prevent terrorist attacks and have a duty to take action, actions against perpetrators for, for such attacks. This essentially followed uh, the, the, um, the 911 uh, attacks in the United States. And so therefore, in relation at least to um, terrorist groups, and of course, terrorist groups will have to operate within the territory of another state because a terrorist group is not, by definition, a state of its own. It has to operate within the territory of another state. It would appear that, it, that uh, in international law, there is, to an extent, the United States has been doing this, that there appears to be a, an assertion on the part of some states that they can engage in an anticipatory right of self-defense to attack terrorist groups operating in another state. And you would see this being done by uh, Turkey attacking, for example, um, you know, terrorist groups within, within Syria or Iraq. Or you see this happening to Israel, Israel 
attacking terrorist groups in Lebanon uh, and other parts uh, of the Middle East. Okay, so it is only in that instance that there seems to be an accepted uh, principle that an anticipatory self-defense uh, can be triggered, can be invoked by a state that is uh, facing an armed attack by a terrorist group hosted by another state. And that is because of UN Security Council Resolution 1373. But in general, the idea of an anticipatory self-defense against another state is not recognized in international law. So that was actually question seven there. So the question seven would have been that, you know, if the terrorist organization were an agent of another state, then potentially it could invoke that state that has been uh, attacked, uh, the subject of an armed attack by a terrorist group, which was the agent of a host state. That, uh, that state could have invoked the anticipatory right to self-defense. Okay, so we're done with the, with the seven questions. Do we have any questions before we end tonight's session? So we're good. So again, thank you everyone for joining tonight's session. Thank you, Clinton, Emma, Ernest, Faye, Heidi, Ilyonka, Jack, Jennifer, Marjorie, Pita, and Tamara, and Tony for joining tonight's session. Even if it's just the day after New Year, continue to enjoy the rest of your holidays. And see you again next week. Bye.